Thank you for uh, having me. Well, um, I, I don't always think about morality, <laughs> but when I do, I think Dick Cheney. <laughs> now, I don't mean this in a partisan in a way at all. In fact, I, the reason I bring him up is because he, uh, his moral system is really so universal in some ways. It reveals these universal truths. So, uh, on. Uh, almost every issue you can imagine, Dick Cheney de uh, defines the right end of the continuum. So he's a military hawk, he's a pro enhanced interrogation, he's a pro life, uh, pro big oil corporations, uh, pro guns. But there's one issue on which he is on the other side. Does anybody know what that is? Same sex marriage. He's, pr he's uh, in favor of same sex marriage. Well, why is that? He's got a daughter who he loves very much, I assume, and who, uh, again, has uh, married with a couple of children. And there's something that's, that's so, uh, you know, sort of important about that, I think, that if you think about, did he, do you think he arose, uh, get, you know, developed this uh, um, uh, uh, set of moral beliefs because of some principled system? He's got a bunch of principles that, that somehow can explain why he's on the right end of the continuum on all these uh, issues and then uh, you know gay marriage uh, has this pro-gay marriage attitude that's probably not what happens what we think it is it's his emotions that somehow his emotions are organizing his moral beliefs and uh, you know, leading him to have this this uh, interesting sort of uh, confluence of, of beliefs and so what I want to talk about a little bit is about what the uh, what that is what kind of moral system that is and how what implications it has for politics and the law so I want to begin with uh, this idea this sort of new uh, view of, of uh, morality that's developed in the last decade uh, that we've uh, called moral intuitionism. It really begins a long time ago with David Hume, uh, the famous philosopher who talked to, who was a, a big fan of the passions. He thought that passion uh, was uh, the, the, the smarter system than reason in many ways and talked about morality depending on our sentiments. When any action or quality of the mind pleases us, we say it is virtuous. Uh, so it's really the, this new view of morality rejects an older view that was uh, we call a rationalist view that really viewed uh, children as little moral philosophers. They were developing these sets of principles that got ever more sophisticated over time. And again, that that's how they, so they use these principles then to decide what's right and what's wrong. But uh, what, what uh, you know, later research has shown, I think very uh, compellingly, is that right or wrong, uh, right and wrong are things that we feel more than things that we think, that we have a sense that things are right or wrong, they're just or unjust. And then when we, uh, you know, it's not that we use a principle to develop those, but rather we decide that they're just, and then we develop the principles uh, backward to uh, explain those in this sort of post hoc fashion. So when you don't really reason very much uh, about our moral beliefs, except for in response to some social demand, some request to explain them or defend them or to persuade other people. Uh, so th again, uh, morality is more this emotional affair than a, than a cognitive affair. And so, but we have to think more broadly about what are the what sort of the uh, the, the emotional infrastructure uh, that underlies it. And what I've been working on for the last six or seven years is uh, in collaboration with John Height uh, at the now at NYU is what's called moral foundation theory that tries to explain what these basic sets of intuitions are that underlie our our, our intuitive morality. And again, the idea is that across cultures and moral systems are built on five basic intuitions or foundations. Uh, they're kind of like moral taste buds. That's an analogy that we use a lot. They're these sensitivities that we have to certain kinds of events that lead us uh, to have these moral reactions. And the five uh, that we talk about are harm and care, the idea that it's, it's right to take care of people, even vulnerable people, and it's wrong to harm uh, others, uh, an innate sense of justice or fairness, uh, based on sort of a quality that, uh, that um, uh, resources should be allocated equitably across people. Uh, In-group loyalty, the idea that we should be uh, loyal to certain groups and that one of the, the sort of worst things you can do morally is to betray a group that you're uh, a part of. Uh, authority and respect, the idea that there are certain authorities that uh, you should, uh, again, accord respect to and, and authoritative institutions uh, that you should respect uh, and honor, and the idea of purity and sanctity, that every 
uh, moral system. Every religion in particular has a, a view of, of a state that's close to God, a state, a state that's, that's pure, that, that's uncontaminated, uh, and that there's ways to sort of uh, uh, contaminate yourself by uh, engaging in certain acts, sexual acts, drug abuse, uh, that sort of thing, that uh, your, your body, not treating your body as a temple, but rather as a plaything. Um, and each of these uh, uh, moral intuitions has a basis in primate uh, evolution. And the whole idea is that there, it's an emotional system that's designed to suppress selfishness and promote uh, group cooperation. Uh, and what's interesting to us now is that these, uh, each of these sensitivities is, is present in all people, we think, uh, but they're dialed up and down. Uh, and people can become more sensitive or less sensitive to some of them you know, based on a complicated uh, set of uh, biological and personal experience factors and, and cultural factors. And so what we've been interested in is to use this theory to try to understand uh, this crazy political environment that we're in now, this hyper-partisan uh, culture war that we're part of, and we've used it to try to explain what it is that the nature, the, the difference in the nature of, of uh, liberal and conservative morality. Uh, one of the things that's a, a sort of tangible product of this collaboration has been a website that uh, we developed called yourmorals.org, which, which we use to collect data. And so people can uh, get onto this website, register. There's a whole series of uh, surveys, questionnaires, uh, experiments on that survey. You get, if you fill these, these out, it, you get feedback that tells you what the study was about, what the, what the questionnaire measured, where you, uh, you know, uh, rank relative to other people. And today we uh, have a data set that has about 400,000 participants in it, so it's a huge data set. And one of the major things that we look at is, is a, this uh, moral foundation questionnaire, which measures these five different uh, moral foundations. And so let me tell you a little bit about the data uh, here. That Again, we, this is a big data set, so in this particular graph has 194,000 people and change. And it's a very stable numbers. Uh, on the left, it, it, it just we simply uh, the judgment here is how relevant each of these things are to your moral uh, beliefs, uh, from extremely relevant to not very relevant. And uh, on the bottom is just uh, a simple sort of uh, typical seven-point scale from very liberal to very conservative politically that people uh, respond to. So uh, again, I'll, and each of these have a little uh, sample item on the bottom. So this is, a, again, a, a multi-item scale, but one sample item, whether or not someone cared for someone who was weak or vulnerable, that's harm. Uh, and uh, whether or not someone uh, treated, or some people were treated differently from others. Again, how relevant are these to your moral system? And what you see in these first two uh, uh, intuitions or foundations show a similar pattern. Almost everyone believes they're very relevant to their moral system, and they differ very little across the political spectrum. There's slight uh, difference where liberals tend to endorse these more uh, than extreme conservatives, but basically high and uh, uh, consistent across them all. The other three show a different pattern. So uh, in group, whether or not someone showed a lack of loyalty, uh, authority, whether or not someone conformed to the traditions of society, uh, and uh, purity, whether or not someone did something that was disgusting. Uh, again, those show a different pattern where liberals tend not to see these as very relevant to their moral systems, but uh, extreme conservatives see them as, as much more relevant. Uh, and so this is the way, if you look across these, what, what you get an image of is of the different moral systems of liberals and conservatives. So liberals essentially have a two-factor morality where if it doesn't harm anybody or it isn't unfair, it's not wrong. These other sorts of things, doing something disgusting or not being loyal to your group, really aren't seen as, as deep moral values that just um, uh, uh, sort of less extreme offenses. Uh, so again, it, it's, it's all about harm and fairness for a liberal. For conservatives, however, they have a five-factor morality such that they basically care about all five of these things about the same. So in-group authority and purity concerns are things that are important to their moral systems. Uh, and this is a very consistent pattern uh, over time, uh, or I mean across, excuse me, over, it, it is over time as well, but it's also across uh, uh, the samples. So let me just give you a little bit of a sample. These are just respondents who come from different parts of the world, and you can see that the same basic pattern shows up everywhere. So here's the uh, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Africa, 
Latin America, the Middle East, South Asia, East Asia, and Southeast Asia. Right, so the same essential pattern here. So it's very consistent. Again, these data aren't quite as, as, as compelling as you might want. These aren't the most native individuals there. They, they speak English. They, they got onto a, a website where they could complete these scales. But again, it shows that this is not, uh, this is a pattern. It's very uh, you know, consistent. And uh, we have a good uh, grip on, on uh, you know, that, uh, that liberals and conservatives, no matter what country, tend to show this sort of pattern. Now, what's interesting is if you apply this to, again, let's go back to this issue of gay marriage, where uh, it makes sense to the, what the different uh, political uh, teams uh, uh, believe about these and how they feel about gay marriage. So from a liberal's perspective, gay marriage and gay marriage laws, something that, we, you know, whether we want to instantiate that in law, is a, a, a great moral cause. It, uh, it, it, there's nothing wrong with it. It doesn't hurt anybody. In fact, it hurts people if they don't have it. And it's only fair that same-sex people can get married. Again, this idea of marriage equality. Uh, uh, What's interesting is that a conservative might very well share those kinds of intuitions at some level. Uh, the, the, the same ideas about harm and fairness, but they also feel that, gee, I wish they'd just be better group members. If they, you hear, uh, very often you will hear people say, well, gee, if gay people would just act more like other people, then it would just be, be fine, right? And so there's this in-group sense of it. Tradition, it's traditional marriage. Uh, so it offends the sort of authority, the sense of uh, traditional institutions. And this, a lot of people have this sense, it's just something that just doesn't seem pure about it. It seems kind of, and I don't, I know, I don't want to throw around technical terms, but icky, <laughs> right? Um, and that's the sense, people have this, this sense. And, what's, and, and so you, from a liberal's perspective, it's a very clear moral question. From a conservative's perspective, even if they're not particularly homophobic, they just, they're, they're morally conflicted about it. There's more going on there, there's certain things that, that, that bother them a little bit about it so that they're less likely to sort of pursue endorsing that, uh, you know, and to put it into law. Now, it's also, you can also see the change occurring. This has been one of the most sort of radical social changes we've seen, uh, you know, in, in recent history, the change in, in opinions about gay marriage. And you can see that some of that is because some of this, as people get to, to know more gay people, as they become more part of the, um, uh, American culture, that uh, the, the, the senses of, of, of ickiness go away, the sense of groupiness uh, uh, start to drift away, and we see, a, a, again, a much more um, uh, positive view of gay marriage emerging. Now, there's another part. So, so you can use this, the, this um, uh, moral foundations theory to try to understand uh, political attitudes and how people feel about laws, can, can these can laws in the big sense, uh, uh, and there's another very insidious effect, however, that they have. And it's captured uh, in part here. This is something you hear a lot these days if you listen to politics. Uh, this quote uh, that's usually attributed to Daniel Patrick Moynihan, that you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Well, the interesting part is that very often people do have their own facts. And uh, this is uh, in part how it emerges, we believe. So again, most of you, if you think about what your uh, political uh, and moral beliefs are, you view them as sort of bottom-up construction. So you have certain principles, uh, you combine those with facts, and with, use a little bit of logic, and you come up with, that's how I decided I'm a liberal or I'm a conservative. Now, what a lot of research uh, suggests, however, is that the process uh, goes the other way around as well, that these political and moral beliefs shape the way and organize the way that we think of principles, facts, and the way we use logic. Uh, so that they, they uh, can change the way that, that, that what we believe about all these things in order to support uh, these intuitions and ground them in principle and fact and, and logic. And we've done research, my lab has done research on, on um, all of these different factors and how they're uh, shaped by uh, political beliefs. Let me give you one uh, example of an experiment that was designed to test this kind of idea. So it was a fairly simple study where we had, uh, took a, uh, 128 UCI students, and we had them record their beliefs about uh, the morality of um, a whole bunch of issues, uh, but the one that we're interested in here is the death penalty. 
So they uh, record their beliefs about the morality and the benefits and costs of the death penalty. By pen benefits, things like whether uh, the death penalty deters crime uh, and the costs are things like whether, you know, if, if you have the death penalty, do you uh, have some, you know, what's the likelihood you're gonna have wrongful executions? So they record their beliefs. Then they uh, read essays uh, that were, were designed to try to change their beliefs about the morality of the death penalty. There was no facts really involved in this. It was just the, the idea that the death penalty is wrong. It's morally wrong to take a life, or it's morally acceptable to take a life. In fact, it's, it's mandatory. If somebody takes somebody else's life, the society really has a moral obligation to uh, take that life back, in a sense. Uh, so they were, we, we were tried to persuade them just about the morality. We never mentioned anything about deterring crime. We didn't mention anything about wrongful executions. These are all just moral arguments. And then we had them at the end re-record uh, their beliefs about morality uh, and costs and benefits. And so uh, let me show you what happens here. So we were able, so just taking one at a time, we were able to, again, move. This is change from pre to post in their beliefs. So we were able to make them uh, in, uh, believe more in the morality of capital punishment. So they thought it was a, uh, this group that, that received the capital punishment essay, the pro-capital punishment essay, believed more in capital punishment afterwards. They also, however, believed uh, much more strongly in whether it deterred crime. And uh, they thought it was less likely to uh, uh, produce wrongful executions, even though we hadn't mentioned those things at all. But just believing that it was more moral made those facts or become, uh, you know, have them believe those uh, facts more. The opposite happens uh, when we have the, we were much more successful at getting them to believe that capital punishment was uh, wrong. And then when you do that, they believe less in the deterrent efficacy of the death penalty, and they believe more uh, in the cost. They estimate the probability of it producing wrongful executions as being higher. And again, these things weren't as important as they weren't mentioned. All we had is give them the feeling that, these, that the death penalty was more wrong or more morally right, and the facts sort of followed along. And so if you think about what the implications of this uh, uh, sort of phenomena are, again, it's a, it's a good explanation. If you look at the culture war today, it's less a war of morality than it is a war about facts. So that we have liberals having their own set of facts, conservatives having their set of facts, and again, they're all organized by these moral intuitions, or at least part of the, the, the process is that if you look at the, the sorts of beliefs, and I don't mean you to read these in particular, uh, but the, the idea is that in, in each case, what's really happening is that people are, are believing that whatever is moral is effective. So the things that they think are morally right are the things that are practically effective, and that helps to explain what a, the, the sort of uh, information gap, belief gap, is in uh, modern politics. So, just to sort of sum up, what, the way I would sort of place myself in this group is this idea that uh, this clash between intuitive morality and the law, which I find so interesting, that in, in a sense you can think of the law as an attempt to codify our moral in intuitions. We want laws that uh, reward the good things we do, punish the bad things that we do, uh, and, but those things often clash, right? That sometimes there are laws that don't seem to us very moral, uh, and people, for example, when there's a, a lot of evidence that people are much more likely to obey a law if they intuitively uh, uh, feel that it's moral. Uh, when they don't, you get the, the, these problems, this sort of clash that I find so interesting. So you see that in these politically controversial issues where two sides simply don't, uh, you know, they, they will fight for one, uh, uh, one will, side will fight for the law because they believe it to be um, you know, morally correct, the other side will fight against. Yeah, you see, uh, yeah, at a smaller level, again, you see these sorts of, uh, this clash, like in, uh, in, in inadmissible evidence. When, you've, when you see some evidence that suggests that this person is guilty, but you just can't use it. You know they're guilty, but you know you're not supposed to use it. That captures that same sort of thing. Another uh, sort of phenomenon that we've been interested in, in my lab is, is moral culpability, and when people perceive somebody as morally responsible for their behavior. And you get these really, there's, this is a, a, a really new area that's gonna be very interesting when we get neuroscientific evidence of uh, some sort of brain uh, dysfunction that uh, uh, an individual has and whether you can, uh, people tend to find that as very plausible explanation that removes moral culpability. Uh, but they don't perceive abuse from a chi in childhood or some of these other things necessarily as uh, exculpatory. Uh, and so there's a lot of intuition about what counts as uh, 
somebody uh, you know, having the, the, uh, the moral responsibility for their actions and what doesn't. All these things, of course, are compounded and, uh, by the fact that these uh, moral intuitions shape facts. And you know, particularly at, the, at the, the political level, the idea that if you think it's hard to agree on anything, if you don't agree on, if you have a, a difference of moral opinion, it is, it's very different if you have a, a, a you know, disagreement about what the basic facts are. And that makes lawmaking uh, very challenging. So I guess it's, it's our hope that uh, understanding intuitive morality can lead to better law. And ultimately, if we understand the way each other think, uh, it'll lead to more civil politics as well. Well, thank you.